Hi, everybody out there. Thanks for attending uh, this Q&A with the Director of Shared Legacies, Dr. Shari Rogers. This is Dr. Elliot Ratzman. Uh, I am teaching African American Studies and Jewish Studies at Grinnell College this year, and I teach in religion departments around the Philadelphia area. Uh, we're here with the Distinguished Director. Uh, for those of you who are just join who are joining us, there is a Q&A box on the bottom of the screen if you run your browser down. Uh, so please deposit a question or a comment, and we'll we'll get to them in short time. So, uh, Dr. Rogers, I should ask you. Uh, first of all, the film is great. It's a I think it would be the standard now that might be shown in courses on Black Jewish relations and uh, the history of this period. Uh, could you tell me tell your audience a bit about how you came to this project? How did why did you decide to to become a filmmaker through this? Well, thank you so much, and I'm grateful to Philadelphia. This is our second showing in Philadelphia, so it is a great honor. And um, I think what's actually kind of extraordinary is um, the, the uh, gentleman that inspired this film is Clarence B. Jones, and he, um, not only was he Dr. Martin Luther King's personal attorney, draft speech writer, and uh, personal confidant, um, I think he's from Philadelphia, actually. But I, had, I, I met him, um, I'm from Detroit, Michigan, and I was at the Charles Wright Museum. It's an African-American museum, one of the best. And, uh, and Clarence Jones had just written a book, um, being a professor at Stanford, he had written a book um, at the time, What Would Martin Say? And one of the chapters was on anti-Semitism. So as a Jewish woman listening into the audience, I was quite struck by his uh, spending a whole chapter uh, on the subject. And he specifically spoke about how a week before Dr. King was assassinated, um, Dr. King had, uh, you know, being the, the director or conductor of the civil rights movement, he would assign different tasks to different people. And one of the tasks that he assigned Dr. Jones to was to re be the reminder of the Jewish contribution to the civil rights movement. He had seen some anti-Semitism already uh, around, and he said, Clarence, I know you will be the one to remind people of the, of the commitment that the Jews had to the struggle, um, of our struggle. So fast forward, um, we developed a friendship, and at the time, President Obama was president. He, um, Clarence was being honored at the Kennedy Center for Performing Arts, and uh, because we were going back and forth, and I was just so curious about his, you know, history in the civil rights movement, and how Claiborne Carson at Stanford University had chosen him to kind of represent the inner mind of Dr. King. Um, Claiborne Carson was given uh, the papers from uh, Coretta Scott King. So they created their, a Stanford um, Martin Luther King uh, separate building, if you will, to kind of review the papers and be the expert. And um, Clarence was being honored at the Kennedy Center uh, in honor of Martin Luther King, uh, uh, Martin Luther King's birthday. So I sort of, he invited me to come and, um, and then from there, um, it was the 50th anniversary from the Selman and Montgomery March. And basically this kind of galvanized Congress and all the living witnesses to the history to come back to Selma and uh, to honor that history. And I think having the first black president at that, um, at that extraordinary event and to be a part of it, um, we thought it would, what an opportune time to film uh, as much as we could, and to get as many witnesses as we, as we could to this coalition. And I had also developed a friendship with Dr. Susanna Heschel, and she had written an op-ed and how it was important also to remember the Jewish contribution to this history. And, and uh, she was invited by Joanna Jackson from the Jackson Home. It's now a museum in Selma where Rabbi Heschel and other rabbis and a lot of the civil rights leaders would gather, would gather there to kind of... Um, strategize, if you will, you know, how to, how about the marches. So um, she had, she was going to be staying with Joanna Jackson. So we thought what a perfect place to kind of do some interviews there. So that's how this, that's how this particular film came together. This is the second time this film festivals has shown it. And I, I understand it's also been going around some of the other festivals. Is that correct? 
Yeah, we're really uh, fortunate because um, the timing of this film, who could have known that the um, tragedy and the murder of George Floyd would galvanize the world, if you will, um, to, to really beginning to say, you know, it's time. It's time to laser focus um, the world on racism. And that as much as we thought we had come far, which we did, um, having the first black president, we still had a whole long way to go. And that there were so many other issues that the America and the world needed to focus on that even though we had you know, signed the Voting Rights Act and, and, and traveled far from the Jim Crow, there was new forms of Jim Crow. You know, whether it was the prison, the high school prison pipeline, whether it was prison reform and, and so many uh, you know, voter suppression, there was so much more that we needed to really unpack white privilege, um, you know, that, that the, this horrible suffocation and watching it as, as uh, you know, now that we have television and, and we were all stuck and suffocating in our own homes, I think this, I think the, it was like the perfect storm, if you will, that we, we, we all as a world community said enough is enough. So as horrible and the tragedy as it is, I think our film is becoming a platform if you will, a foundational platform to have courageous conversations about, about this topic and, and to look to history and certain coalitional partners that were involved in this history and how this template in history can be used to talk about allyship today. Did you get a chance to screen the film before COVID uh, descended? Uh, yeah, it was, it was um, actually we pushed to get the film ready. I was really six months out because I had interviewed a lot of young folks and um, uh, Sherry Frank, who was Congressman Lewis's Jewish, you know, soulmate partner, if you will, who restarted the Black Jewish Coalition in the early 80s. Um, she was a part of the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival and she had helped also raise funds with Congressman Lewis and Reverend C.T. Vivian in attendance at the temple for this film. And uh, it was the um, 20th anniversary of the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival. And so we, we were fortunate right before COVID to show the film. And uh, we had Peter Yero uh, opening the film with the Ebenezer Church singing uh, Blowing in the Wind with the Temple, their, their kind of partner in Atlanta. And uh, then we had a panel discussion. We brought in the national director of the NAACP, Derek Johnson was a part of it and Clarence Jones. and everybody like so many people in the film it was just amazing i have to give um kenny blank credit for really you know rolling up his sleeves and paying a lot of honorarians to get a lot of the folks from in the film who couldn't even be part of the panel discussion after to really show up for this um for this film uh showing in atlanta so i'm indebted i have a tremendous gratitude towards kenny blank and the atlanta jewish film festival for and we, we actually won the jury prize for building bridges as well you uh, mentioned before that you had a, a lot of other footage. Uh, are we going to see that on the uh, deleted scenes in the DVD version? Uh, well, what, what, what didn't make it in that you want us to know that is there? A lot didn't make it in. You can imagine, I don't know if anybody's a filmmaker, you know, you, you, you take some of the best sound bites, but even though those might be the best sound bites, so much is left out that really, you know, we need to learn as much as we can in this history. So with the 100 hours that did not make it into the film, we're gonna create, we're looking to create seven minute sound bites and then create a curriculum that not only supports the film, but creates the, the sound bites so that it can be taught in short segments. Because as you know, younger people have the patience, you know, for 10 minutes nowadays with the whole internet craze and everything. So I think it's a much more, it will be a much more effective way as a teaching tool to have shorter sound bites. So like one of the sound bites or one of the examples is we didn't, um, we did a whole segment on Strange Fruit where I interviewed the son of the author of Strange Fruit. And um, he, uh, it was an amazing story. Uh, that's a whole story in and of itself that most people don't know that Strange Fruit was written by a Jewish man and that his wife sang the original song and that they brought it to an in the, the integrated pub where he gave the song to Billie Holiday. It's a whole story in and of itself and a, and a phenomenal story. So in terms of just like the entertainment connections in black Jewish relations. Um, that, was, uh, Abe, that was Abe Mirapol, right? Yeah, Abe Mirapol. And, and we interviewed adopted, 
his adopted sons were actually the Rosenbergs. Is that right? Exactly, exactly. And they're the only, his, the son's parents were executed by the government. And even though, you know, it's a whole other story in itself, I mean, his, their son thought that was, had to do with anti-Semitism as well. So, and it was a, a, a black um, friend of Abe Maripal's that actually introduced uh, him to these little boys that would have been orphans. So it, it's just, even the backstory is quite a beautiful story actually. And um, yeah, there's so many stories like, um, for instance, Rabbi Sugarman, who was the rabbi who took over from the temple from Rabbi Rothschild, he was at the deathbed of Hosea Williams with Jesse Jackson and just holding hands and praying over, you know, Hosea Williams and so many of these personal stories that, you know, I couldn't make it into the film. And I think what we, I hope that everybody sees from this film is that real relationships developed and it's not just, you know, showing up for Martin Luther King Day or, you know, they were real relationships and a lot of work that went into, you know, achieving the goals that we achieved historically. So you were, we were talking before that uh, you're hoping to make a, this as, as an educational tool. Uh, could you talk, say a few words about that? And, and then I have actually some old items I want to show you and, and the audience on uh, Black Jewish education that I've uncovered in my research. Sure. Um, well, our organization is called SpillTheHoney.com, and um, basically our foundation is using the arts to promote human dignity, uh, looking at the Holocaust and the Civil Rights Movement, the connection between the two, and creating um, a video curriculum that supports this for educators, for museums, for organizations. Michigan State tomorrow is having our Congresswoman um, speak on, uh, on this history in the diversity department, the diversity inclusion department. And before Congressman Lewis passed away, American Jewish Committee with our Congresswoman who initiated this Black Jewish Caucus that there never had been one, now created a Black Jewish Caucus that is going to be um, creating legislation to stop hate and looking at our communities as being, um, you know, leaders, if you will, and bringing in folks all over to, to stop this hate speech and to promote uh, legislation against racism and anti-Semitism. But in, in my research, I went looking for specifically anti-racist materials from the Jewish world. Uh, so in my, my book project, which I'll be talking about, uh, well, I should say, which will be coming up, uh, I, I found a good number of sort of educational materials that, for example, um, uh, mainstream Jewish organizations have, had created in the late 60s, addressing a range of issues like this. I'm going to show you all the panelists. Uh, you had programming manuals on blacks, uh, for blacks and Jews, Jews conversations about that. Um, a, you had teacher's guide to the only uh, sustained anti-racist Jewish theology book, which is now largely unknown, Justice, Justice, uh, um, a Jewish view of, of black power by Rabbi Henry Cohn. So it's actually, there's actually an interesting track record of the mostly reformed Jewish community coming up with um, educational materials and programs, but usually anti-racism uh, takes a back seat to a whole litany of Jewish values and Jewish causes uh, along social justice. Um, but in recent years, there have been some really interesting pronounced anti-racist materials from like uh, Jews for uh, Racial and Economic Justice, J. Fredge, uh, and other groups uh, who sort of updated this, this material. Um, your, your film mostly stays within the civil rights narrative but then the, the last 20 minutes is a really interesting sort of uh, sort of rapid move through a number of issues uh, in the last few decades. Uh, conflict around Israel just a bit, um, a little bit of the legacy. Um, I'm wondering how you're going to manage the post-civil rights reality, which is so complex. Uh, there was a voice in the film that said there was a 30-year hiatus. And, and I think that's actually not true, that there was a lot of Jewish Jewish and African American engagement uh, over a number of issues, both cooperation and some tensions. So I was wondering how that was going to get managed in the 
in the materials to follow. Well, I think, thank you for that. And uh, first of all, Dr. Ratzman, I welcome you into joining our uh, professors as, as, you know, enlisting some of your books and some of your works. And, you know, we welcome as much as we can. So, you know, kudos to you and all the work that you're doing. Um, but in terms of like the, the, the you know, the not as high uh, coalition part of it that, um, um, that we discussed in the film, I think you're right in the sense that even if you look at politics in California, Jews are, were always in the inner circle in terms of uh, trying to vote for black political people in California and, and all over. Um, but um, I think that, you know, we were looking at some of the disconnect there having to do with, um, with uh, let's say in New York, there were Jewish teachers in New York, and I think a lot of the black families wanted to see their teachers look like their children. So there was affirmative action that caused it at one point Jews to pit, um, you know, the, the teacher issue the Israel issue also, and prior to the 67 war, many of the black um, leaders, um, uh, including and intellectuals, including Dubois and um, even Malcolm X looked at Zionism to promote black nationalism. You know, they, they looked at Zionism in, in a way to like encourage black nationalism, but then after the 67 war, there was more of an identification with the Palestinians in terms of, you know, that they were more the underdogs and who was ever in power then became more viewed in more of the context of racism. Um, so I think that caused a little bit of a disconnect in many of the dollars then, or not all of the dollars, but some of the dollars that were being put in the focus in, in terms of this coalition were then put towards supporting Israel. Um, so I think that was, you know, contributing to to that sort of disconnect and and then the black power movement there was you know there's a debate even within that i mean you hear clarence jones talking about how jews were kicked out but then i also interviewed some SNCC members who said jews were just reallocated to like you know not being in, in certain central roles that they could be more in a dangerous role they were reallocated to kind of talk to their communities about how they could help so, you know, there's the nuances, I think, where the curriculum and some of the seven minute pieces and you can get really into the nuances. I was trying to focus on, I know there was a film on this subject looking at more the disconnect. And I think, you know, what a better time now to look about the positive coalitions and, and come away with this feeling of ins inspiration to see, you know, to kind of lay a foundation that can we can build off of in terms of the all the different nuances of the coalition and different partnership. When I was interviewing Congressman Lewis at one of the Women's Foundation um, events, so many women from different states would come up to me afterwards and say, I have a story for you. I have a story for you. My family helped with the Selma to, you know, my dad was a judge and he helped to make sure that there was, you know, legal implications so that they could cross the bridge and just all these different stories that are so unknown that, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to compare this to like the Holocaust survivors, you know, bearing witness after the Spielberg film, but I think, you know, testimony, we learn from that, the testimony is important, and there's so many testimony while people are alive to, to talk about this coalition, I think it's important. Yeah, let me just make a, a, a quick pitch too for the, the latest historical scholarship on that Black Power question. Mark Dollinger uh, in San Francisco has an excellent book called Black Power Jewish Politics, where he actually goes into the minutes of mainstream Jewish organizations and sort of reviews the way that they were understanding Black Power, which is mostly very positive. And they were seeing that these moves for, by SNCC were a sign of healthy growth. And just like uh, Jewish organizations stood up for themselves, that uh, African-American organizations would now no longer be sort of uh, dependent, perhaps, on white donors and white volunteers. So there's a, that, that book, which came out two years ago or so, has really nuanced our understanding about uh, the question of black power. Now, Dr. Rogers, one of the things that your, 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 your film does really well uh, is also give us a glimpse of questions of Jews of color and their challenges now. And so you've given some re uh, really interesting time to voices. And we have a question from John Bright. The question is, does the young black Jewish woman whom you interviewed towards the end of the film have a body of work 
And if so, could you describe and comment on it? Um, I think that might have been McCoy. Yeah, Vila McCoy, she's one of the leaders in, um, uh, in this whole discussion. And I think, I think we all, I think Jews are, um, you know, are really, um, you know, we're, we're not a monolith. And I think, you know, we're so proud of really our, our Jewish uh, sisters who um, are also black that can really lead this discussion because they have the experience um, of what it's, you know, like to be black in America and Jewish. And, you know, she also has a personal story. Her family, you know, worked with Dr. Kane. So she's, she's really a phenomenally fascinating person. And her whole family, I think, um, is very involved in Black Jewish relations. She has an Orthodox sister. And, you know, even learning from her Orthodox sister, um, you know, it, it's been tough. The Jewish community, I think, has a long way to go also in, in, in terms of their own prejudices and as, and as you know I show so many positive stories in this movie you know I think we also have a long way to go in terms of you know what the Jewish community is also made up of many uh, Jews of color and uh, and you know I think we will you know that's a whole nother that's a whole nother film in itself. I was even thinking there should be a film on black Jews or the black rabbi. And I think that that could be like one of the next films that I think is an important one that could be produced. Right. Philadelphia uh, is actually the home of several intersections in uh, Jews, the history of Jews of color. Uh, some of the Judaic versions of um, uh, of Ju uh, sort of African American Judaism have emerged here in Philadelphia, have, have roots here in Philadelphia, as well as the organization Jews of all Jews in all hues. Uh, Jared Jackson's project uh, is also grounded here in Philadelphia, and our establishment institutions have a history of some really interesting projects. Uh, there's uh, an organization that takes uh, young uh, African Americans and Jewish. Uh, students uh, on educational trips and uh, actually physical trips to Israel uh, to the south the civil rights uh, tour. So we're very proud here. We have some more Philly pride this month. Uh, we should also point out that in terms of black Jewish relations, there's some very interesting moments. We also hear of Mount Airy, which I'm coming to you from right now, which is uh, heralded as, as a kind of model for a, a neighborhood that resisted um, blockbusting during the 1960s. Uh, so it's a, it's a sort of integrated community here between Blacks and Jews. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're like to think that we were also, Philadelphia is deserving of the film in itself on its questions of, of Blacks and Jews. Um, let me see if there's any other questions from the attendees. Uh, just uh, post it down there in the Q&A. Um, I want to ask you a bit about the, the people that you interviewed. Maybe the people that you wanted to interview but couldn't. Now, uh, you know, John Lewis, uh, blessed memory, C.T. Vivian died here in 2020. 2020 has been a terrible year. Uh, were there people that you would have liked to have interviewed but didn't get a chance to this time around? Um, I think mainly more so some of the, a lot of the younger folks that are the intellectuals leading it, like um, Tanisha Coates and some of the um, um, Michelle Alexander, who wrote the book, The New Jim Crow. Um, I think um, um, I, I think it's important to, you know, that's another thing where I, I have this uh, vision of creating kind of a focus group where they watch the film and then I film them kind of talking about where they see this film fitting into Black Jewish relations today, because I do see this film as a historical piece of work that can, you know, spark these kind of discussions that are important. So I think that would be really neat to film these leaders in, in, in sort of um, the black Jewish space or even in the racism space that can then see how this film, you know, how it speaks to them. And I think that would be really neat of creating sort of a focus, focus group. You, have, you also now have a number of young uh, African-American rabbis. Um, who have graduated now from RC and are in the process of uh, going through their rabbinic, rabbinical ordination. Um, so, you know, that might also have been uh, some choices. The, um, you have though some extraordinary interviews. Uh, might you say a few words about your relationship with Susanna Heschel? Susanna Heschel. 
Well, she's been so amazing. Um, I, I, I mentioned at the beginning that I started filming her at the Jackson home, but um, you know, not only is she the daughter of Rabbi Joshua Heschel, but she's also an expert in Jewish history. She's an expert on her father's life. Um, I think, um, you know, she, some of the, some of the, what she talks about for me that was really moving is that, you know, we forget that Rabbi Heschel, when we're talking about him, we forget that, you know, his sisters were murdered in Nazi Germany, that his, mo that his mother was murdered, his sisters was, were murdered, and that um, he comes to America, and like she says, you know, when your family's murdered, you could lay in bed and, you know, that would be understandable, but that, you know, that he takes this rabbinical rabbi, he was trained from these like brilliant Orthodox rabbis, and that he takes that knowledge and he was able to bring it down. So in 1963, when he meets Dr. Martin Luther King for the first time at Race and Religion, he's actually able to take this biblical context and say that, you know, it was easier for the Israelites to cross the Red Sea than it was for, ne than it is for Negroes to cross the college campus. So to have this like, brilliant man who's come up for books and he was able to take the Torah and the Old Testament and connect it to praying with his feet that there was a there's a social action component that's very directly tied into Torah and I think he was able Rabbi Heschel was able to motivate and inspire so many rabbis who sort of kind of kept the biblical context within the confines of a temple and where they it motivated many to kind of pray with their feet and roll up their sleeves and 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 be a part of the social action but at the same time she reminds us of how it's never disconnected from torah so i think that's really important and how she tells beautiful stories of the rebbe and 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 educating you know her father and about you know being sensitive to people's pain but one story she tells about is that a week before um Dr. King was, a week after Dr. King was murdered, he was actually supposed to eat at the Heschel home for Passover. So she says, can you, you know, what a loss, tremendous loss of the world loss to, you know, the assassination of Dr. King, but can you envision what would that have, what would that have meal been like, you know, having Dr. King at a Passover dinner? What would that have been like? Right, and also, Heschel was kind of unique because he was one of the very, 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 very few Orthodox and certainly ultra-Orthodox rabbis who were involved at all in this sort of politics. He stands out as a great exception. Most of the rabbis were drawn from the reform movement and some from the conservative movement. But your film uh, also interviews Rabbi Saul Berman uh, from Yeshiva. Yeah, he's Orthodox. Right? He's Orthodox right. in Columbia. Right. And, um, you know, he... he he actually is interesting because he said a lot of the Orthodox rabbis, you know, were, were just sort of trying to struggle themselves coming off the Holocaust and trying to, you know, but at the same time, you know, he, he's interesting because he was in jail in Selma and it was Purim and he was teaching many of the Jewish young students who were next to him about Purim. And they weren't there particularly because they were religious. So he thought it was important to teach them about Purim and the Megillah and everything. And, um, and how it took the 50th anniversary from the Selma and Montgomery March for him to revisit his own um, civil rights um, participation and use it now as a teaching method for his own students. Yeah, that's very interesting. And we should note too that many, uh, that the disproportionate number of Jews who went down to uh, work in the South um, as something like, uh, I forgot what the exact number is, either a third to a half of all the white volunteers were Jewish, um, but also the vast majority of them were also secular, red diaper babies coming out from some secular left tradition within Judaism. Um, and that, that Heschel, um, his, his legacy after the civil rights, um, let's say uh, in that trajectory of the civil rights movement also goes into the anti-war movement where he becomes an outstanding Jewish figure in the anti-war movement in uh, clear, clergy and laity concern, or then it was just clergy concern about the war in Vietnam. Uh, but his colleagues at, at JTS were not so, so supportive of, the, of his activity. And there was a lot of concern that he was bringing too much attention to uh, the Jewishness of what he was doing. Now we revere 
uh, uh, Rabbi Heschel is, is a sort of saint, uh, but at the time he was still a kind of outcast, even at JTS. I'm sure some of your interviewers and um, you even know, Dr. Martin Luther King, when I interviewed you know many people close to Dr. Martin Luther King, Ambassador Young, and others said there was many in the black community who thought that he was moving too fast and it was not just, you know, that there, he wasn't, he was, you know, if you saw the movie, um, one of the recent movies about Dr. King, that he was very depressed at the end of his life in many ways because he wasn't supported by his own community um, in many ways. So um, that's where, you know, King and Heschel sort of were similar in that way as well. Yeah, uh, and one of the other people that you interviewed, Michael Eric Dyson, has written a very lovely book uh, on King's last year. I think it's called April April third, uh, nineteen sixty uh, sixty eight. And um, the 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 King was so depressed during that last year, and it was and it was due primarily uh, because of the the lack of support that liberals dropped after he came out against the Vietnam War. So not only was he catching hell from more conservative elements of the African American community, but also parts of the liberal establishment were upset that he was bucking uh, L um, Lyndon Johnson's sort of uh, war in Vietnam. This was causing a lot of trouble in his organizations. Um, and Dyson captures this really well in that lovely short book he has. Um, Speaking uh, of Dyson, I was supposed to call him today, actually, Dr. Dyson. Interestingly enough, he's also, um, in a small way, teaching on Black Jewish relations at HBCUs. I thought that was really interesting. But among his, you know, works that he just did a book on Jay Z and all these other things that he, um, you know, carves out a segment to make sure that this is an area that he teaches on. I think that's pretty extraordinary. Yeah, he's great. Um, and also, he uh, he agreed to to be interviewed for Heb Magazine, which I conducted years ago, which I'll try to put in the link if I can find. And uh, we talked about, uh, among other things, uh, our shared interest in mutual thinkers around questions of love and Black Jewish relations. Um, so I wanted also to point out, uh, tell, tell us a little bit more about Clarence Jones, because he's not a, as, as well known as some of the other figures in uh, the SL, um, the Southern um, Christian Leadership Conference. Um, and he's a very dapper, dapper dresser, uh, but what else, uh, how else did, um, did you find him and what other opportunities did he give you to give insight into the King's private life and his person? Well, he's, first of all, he's turning 90 years old this January 8th. God bless him. And uh, you can really sing. I, I always say to Clarence, I say, I can't even imagine. You have so much energy now and you're leading not only, you know, he's now the director of USF's um, nonviolence organization. But I can't even imagine him and Dr. King back then and Harry Belafonte, like, oh my God, you know? Um, he, the, the, his personal story was just so interesting because he was on the cover of Fortune Magazine as a young man. He was partners with Sandy Weil. He was one of the first business people to be on the stock exchange. And um, Dr. King comes to him because he wanted a black attorney. I mean, he, he comes to his house and, uh, Basically, he had heard that, you know, that he, he was a genius when it comes to the law. And uh, Clarence was always already on his way to, uh, you know, really be a top financial, financial guy, you know, being on the, you know. And so he, he said that he needed some help with, in Birmingham, that, you know, that they were going to put him in jail and he needed some help. And basically, Clarence wasn't interested at first. It was really his wife that said, are you kidding me? You're not gonna help Dr. King? You have to. And, and so Dr. King, as wise as he was, he invited him, and he was already popular at this time to a church service the following day. And uh, so he invites him to a church service and that he was giving. And in the service, Clarence decided to go, his wife encouraged him to go, and uh, despite his hesitation, and in the service he says, you know, there is somebody in this audience here whose touch, his hands has been touched by God. And uh, he doesn't realize whence he came from. And then he uh, brilliantly recites a poem by Langston Hughes about mother and son. And, and Clarence's mother was a domestic worker, both his parents were. 
and she had to get him up for um, adoption, not adoption, but to a foster home, if you will, when he was five, because the white family she was taking care of wouldn't allow him to stay any longer in the home. So, you know, the fact that she had worked and um, so much so that he could, you know, achieve. So I think after, you know, he was looking around when Dr. King was like talking about who's this brilliant guy, but obviously, you know, he realized it was him. And then afterwards he basically, you know, shook Dr. King's hand and says, when do we start? So that's like their initial meeting was, you know, it's touching when he tells that story. And later on, he sort of provides not only as advisor and speechwriter, but Stanley Levinson actually was already close to Dr. King and he sort of provides the, um, you know, he, he worked within Stanley, with Stanley Levinson and Dr. King. And at the time, the FBI was trying to stop that relationship um, because Stanley had some prior, you know, relationships with communism. And, and, um, and then Harry Belafonte would help fundraise and Clarence would meet with different people strategically and um, lots of great stories. Yeah, we should also speak very quickly, perhaps, about um, the two famous uh, interviews you did, one with uh, Harry Belafonte, but also somebody who's very, all eyes are on him now, uh, Reverend Warnock down in Atlanta, who's running for Senate, and the control of the Senate lies in his success or failure uh, in this uh, runoff election in January. So perhaps, uh, could you tell us a bit about Reverend Warnock? Uh, mo well, I think most start. of us don't know about him. Yeah, let me start with Reverend Warnock. I mean, he, first of all, he's, um, he's the, if you saw him recently on television, he was the reverend that presided over Congressman John Lewis's funeral. And he's uh, Dr. Bernice King's reverend and uh, reverend. And he is just so extraordinary. And he's developed such a close relationship with Rabbi Berg from the temple. And the temple, if you saw in the film, was the temple that was bombed because Rabbi uh, Rothschild worked so hard to give the first, to make sure that Dr. King, after he won the Nobel Peace Prize, had the first integrated dinner in Atlanta. But they work tirelessly together. They're, they're um, Reverend Warnock's working on, you know, legislation against white uh, supremacy, and Rabbi Burke works along with him, and he's just been such a supportive, um, you know, person for the Jewish people, and just an amazing, an amazing person, and I, I just think seeing the two of them kind of interact together, it kind of you know, that's why at the end of the film, I have them walking together because they kind of represent that legacy continues. They don't just show up for each other's temples on Martin Luther King Day. They work together. They, they give sermons in each other's temple. They do legislation together. They're quite, they're quite a team that represents the legacy continues, um, you know. And um, I was also, I think the hard, one of the hardest interviews I did was with um, Harry Belafonte because, um, you know, just being in his presence was just like, you know, you're just, you know, it was, it was, I brought um, Hillel Levine with me. He's a professor from Boston. And um, so that was, that was helpful, I think, but he was just extraordinary. And I think he just, you know, really had, you can see it in the film. He had a tremendous personal appreciation of the Jewish people. Um, he went into, which I didn't include as much, the whole labor movement and how, you know, they were, how the Jewish people were so involved in the labor movement and uh, his own personal history with Israel and how he would go to Israel and meet with, you know, Moshe Dayan and different people was interesting. Ambassador Young talks about that too, how Dr. King, um, you know, had wanted more blacks to go to Israel. I thought that was an interesting story that I didn't get to put into the film and how Ambassador Young had literally bought 5,000 tickets uh, for, for, for blacks to go to Israel and Dr. King was going to preach, you know, in the, in the sea of Galilee. And, you know, so that's a whole nother story. No, you can see the, some of those documents at the, at the, the website that Claiborne Carson curates this, uh, lost trip, uh, that never happened where he was to be, be preaching peace on, in the sea of Galilee. Um, uh, King did go to Israel, uh, as, as you probably know, uh, he did make a trip, uh, during the time that he was um, go going to India. Uh, it's it recounted in his essay, uh, My Pilgrimage to the Land of Gandhi, if I remember that title correctly. 
uh, and he used it in the final sermon, which he preached uh, the night before he was killed, where he, he recounts how he and Coretta were traveling down the Jericho Road, um, where the site of the Good Samaritan parable was. And so he, he talks a bit about um, the, the details, the like geographic details of that, spinning that into a lesson on courage, a speech, his final speech that he gave, delivered to uh, striking um, sanitation workers in Memphis uh, in April, uh, April on, that, that speech was April 3rd, 1968. Um, so, we're about to wrap up here. Let me see if there's any more questions or comments from our um, audience. And um, while I'm doing that, I just want to say that uh, the, the film was very good. It was great to see, um, for example, uh, Rabbi Susan Taub uh, from St. Louis, uh, who was a leader in the Ferguson clergy, who was organized, and uh, Rabbi Jonah Pesner, a very important figure in contemporary Jewish community organizing and now um, one of the high ups in the reform movement and, and heads the rack. Um, so uh, I wish you very much well, and I guess we'll be in touch about talking about this follow up for the educational bit. Um, yeah, after we get off, I want to follow up with you because I, you know, I'm on a lot of these panels, but I think you're pretty extraordinary yourself, and um, we we could welcome your your knowledge and expertise. You're 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 amazing. <laughs>